Hello everyone. Today we are going to review unit three a little bit and unit four. Uh, so if you would like to take notes as we go, please do. If you hear a fan in the background, that's just the uh, my computer. I've been trying to figure out if I can record and you guys not have to have that in the background, but it's just not working in my favor and I'm unwilling to pay for an app that will let me record a different way. So I'm sorry if it gets on your nerves, uh, but hopefully you'll be able to just ignore it as we move uh, through the PowerPoint. So uh, to start us off, I want to review with you a couple of uh, key points of the periodic table. Uh, so first off, if you hear the word group or family, that's a column on the periodic table. So going up and down is a group. Okay, the group is going to tell us the number of valence electrons. So this big group in the middle has a variable valence, meaning that we don't always know how many valence electrons it's going to lose. Uh, when we do chemical nomenclature, that's what the Roman numerals are for, okay? Another uh, key vocabulary word is to know that on the periodic table, a period is a row, okay? So that's going left to right across the periodic table gives us a period, all right? Other big ideas that we talked about in unit three that I think is worth reviewing at this moment are the uh, family names. So we learned that group one are the alkali metals here in group one. Group two is going to be alkaline earth. Okay. In the middle, we have the transition metals. All right. Skip a bunch of groups, and um, group seven are the halogens. Group eight are the noble gases. So we had two rows. Uh, this top row here are the lanthanides, starting off with lanthanum, and this bottom row are the actinides, starting off with actinum. So if you are just able to locate and recall those family names, then I think that you'll be good to go for unit three review. Uh, so what I want to transition into talking about now is going to be what we spend the most time on uh, this lecture video, and that's going to be all about chemical bonds. So remember, our group numbers tell us our number of valence electrons. Oh, sorry, and I wanted to mention one more time that over to the left-hand side of our staircase, we have metals. Up in the top right corner are where our nonmetals are located, okay? So <clears throat> everything over here, let me use the highlighter. From here over, we've got a bunch of metals, okay? And then the other side of the staircase are all going to be nonmetals. So please remember that the group number tells us our number of valence electrons and that every atom on the periodic table wants eight valence electrons but only the noble gases have the that number of valence electrons and so that gives us a problem so our problem is going to be solved with chemical bonding okay so let me erase this a little bit and we're going to go up to a different part of my whiteboard All right, so bond, bonding. Atoms bond to satisfy the octet rule. Chemical bonds are strong electrostatic attractions. Bonds are called intramolecular forces. And anytime you have the word compound, we are just talking about two or more elements bound together. So we've talked a lot about free elements versus compounds. So that shouldn't be much of a review. Now, 
An ionic bond is a very strong, elect a strong bond. Ionic bonds are typically called salts. You're always going to have a metal bonded to a non-metal. And ionic bonds transfer electrons. So we're going to have a crystalline structure of a cation anion network. So these two images here are just showing you what the uh, structures of ionic bonds will look like in 3D. Okay. Our second type of bond that you have to know are covalent bonds. Covalent bonds are typically called molecules, whereas ionic bonds were called salts. Uh, covalent bonds are made of two or more nonmetals. Covalent bonds share electrons, and one pair of electrons is going to be one bond. One pair gives us one bond. So, if you were to figure out in a lab which is which, um, these are some things to look for. So ionic bonds have high melting points and boiling points. Their ionic bonds are hard and brittle, where covalents are soft and flexible. Ionic bonds conduct electricity when dissolved, and they do that because ions are present. So in general, it's safe to assume that ionic bonds are stronger than covalent bonds. But even within this covalent bond uh, environment, if you have a polar covalent bond, it is going to be stronger than what's called a nonpolar covalent bond. So we're going to talk about polarity um, at the end of our lecture. So obviously you probably don't have a whiteboard at home, but we're just going to think about whether or not we have um, an ionic or a covalent bond. Okay. So the first thing you got to do is be able to put your finger on all of the atoms that are present. So K is a metal, chlorine is a nonmetal, so this is going to be an ionic bond. Okay, sulfur is a nonmetal, oxygen is a nonmetal, so it's going to be a covalent bond. Fe2O3 is another ionic bond because iron is a metal and oxygen is a nonmetal. Ca3PO42. So calcium is definitely a metal. This is phosphate. Polyatomic ions are groups of covalent molecules. So we have a metal and a nonmetal, giving us an ionic bond. Glucose, carbon and hydrogen and oxygen are all nonmetals. Yes, hydrogen is on the left-hand side of the periodic table, but it's just out of place. This is a covalent bond. All right, AS4F2 is also a covalent bond. If you look here at oxygen, we have two of the same atoms. That's fine. Oxygen's a nonmetal, so it's going to be a covalent bond. And this one, sodium acetate, is going to be an ionic bond because sodium is a metal. And then acetate or polyatomic ion is a big group of nonmetals. Okay, so that's just a very quick little review of why we bond and what type of bonds exist. Okay, so what I want to look at now is what we spent lots and lots of time doing in Unit 4, and that's drawing Lewis structures. So these notes here are on your uh, worksheet already. So drawing Lewis structures. Uh, the first thing that you have to do is find the total number of valence electrons in our molecule. And to do that, we multiply by our subscripts in the formula. Uh, so NH3 is our first molecule that I'm going to draw. Nitrogen is in group 5. Hydrogen is in group 1. I need to multiply that 1 by 3. And so then that's going to give us 8 total electrons in our picture. So that's step number 1. Step number 2, divide the total number by 2. So that gives me 4 pairs in our picture. So we did step number two. Step number three, put the atom that is farthest away from fluorine in the middle. That means it has the lowest electronegativity. And then it says hydrogen never goes in the middle. So that means that we have to put nitrogen in the middle for our picture. And then step four, place the other atoms around the outside. So I'm going to put three hydrogens on the outside. So that took care of step number three and step number four. Draw one single bond from each outside atom to the central atom. So one, two, three bonds is what I've drawn. 
Step six says subtract the number of bonds you used. So I had four pairs. I've used three. I have one left. All right, so now it says draw in lone pairs around each outside atom to satisfy the octet rule. Hydrogen never has lone pairs, and leftover pairs go on the center. So in other molecules, these outside atoms are all going to have dots or lone pairs around them. Hydrogen can never have dots, so my notes said to go ahead and put the extra pair onto our center atom. So we've used up all of our pairs, and so that's what our that's our final structure. So we did step seven, and then step eight says check your center atom for an octet before you are finished. So remember, the whole reason why we're making chemical bonds is to satisfy the octet rule. So octet rule is eight valence electrons or four pairs of electrons because four times two is eight. All right. So I have one, two, three, four pairs of electrons around my nitrogen. So it is stable with eight. All right. So I have a couple of other examples to draw for you. So I'm not going to keep referencing. Oops, sorry. If you want to look at these notes, I'm going to read them over and over and over again. They are already written on your worksheet, so you don't have to write them down. Okay, so let's look at number two. I'm giving you SO2 minus two. Sulfur is in group six plus six times two from our, from our oxygen. And then with this minus two, we need to add two electrons on as well. So six plus 12 plus two. 6 plus 12 is 18, 18 plus 2 is 20. So we have 20 total electrons in our picture. 20 divided by 2 is going to give us 10 total pairs. Um, I'm going to put sulfur in the middle, oxygen's on the outside. Now I draw two bonds, so minus 2. So I'm going to have 8 pairs left. So now I start putting dots or lone pairs on the outside atoms. So one, two, three, four, five, six, and then leftover goes on the center, so seven, eight. So I have no lone pairs left, and so my structure is finished as long as my center atom is happy with eight uh, valence electrons. So here's one pair, two, three, and four. So sulfur has a satisfied octet rule. We're good to go. All right, number three. SO3, we have um, sulfur is again group 6 plus 6 times 3, so that's going to be 6 plus 18, which is going to give us 24. So I divide that by 2, gives me 12. All right, so I put sulfur in the middle. 1, 2, Three oxygens have to subtract out my pairs. That gives me nine pairs left. So here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I've used up all nine of my pairs. And so now when I go to check my oct for octets, I have one, two, three pairs around my central atom. So my center atom is not happy. So we need to look at step eight very carefully check your center atom for an octet before you are finished if the center atom does not have an octet is it part of CNOPS if yes erase the lone pair from your outside atoms and share it with the central atom so sulfur is part of CNOPS these are the only atoms that are able to double or triple bond so I erase a lone pair and I make it a shared pair. So now I have a double bond between my sulfur and my oxygen. So I have one, two, three, four total pairs to my sulfur, and so that makes my picture finished. Now remember, you could have put your double bond on either side because all of these atoms are part of CNOPS. So our vocabulary word for this was resonance. We can have multiple correct 
affect Lewis structures due to the location of the double bond. But ultimately, please remember, only CNOPs can double and triple bond. And then I stop erasing and I stop sharing once my center atom has four pairs around it. All right, so let's look at BECL2. So BECL2. Beryllium is going to be in group 2 plus 7 times 2 for our chlorine. So 2 plus 14 gives us 16 total. We divide that by 2 to give us 8 pairs. I put beryllium in the center. I bond 2 chlorines. And I subtract the pairs. So I have 6 pairs left. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So if you look at our center atom, I only have two pairs. But the catch is if it's not part of CNOPs, then leave it alone. So neither beryllium nor chlorine is part of CNOPs. So that just means that this is an exception to the octet rule and that beryllium doesn't have to have eight valence electrons, okay? Now, the last two things that we covered in unit four with our uh, Lewis structures was being able to figure out what's called the molecular geometry, okay? Our molecular geometry. So that means we start with a Lewis structure and then we, um, we start with the Lewis structure and then we figure out how many um, bonds it has as well as lone pairs. So when you look here at our structure for NH3, I have three bonds and I have one lone pair. So when I look at our little chart, three bonds, one lone pair gives me a trigonal pyramidal or trigonal pyramidal molecular geometry. Trigonal pyramidal molecular geometry. All right, so let's look at SO2. I have uh, two bonds and I have two lone pairs on my center atom. So when I look at my chart, two bonds, two lone pairs is going to make our structure bent. Okay. SO3, we have, everything's going to count as one, even though we have a double bond. So I'm going to have three bonds and no lone pairs on my center atom. So SO3, three bonds, no lone pairs. It's going to give us a trigonal planar geometry. Okay, and then BECL2, I have two bonds, zero lone pairs, so that's going to make it linear. Two bonds, zero lone pairs, and it's going to be linear. So, if you also look at this line for linear, it just says if we have two atoms, then it's linear. So you can have very small Lewis structures. So let's look at oxygen gas, O2. Six times two is going to give us 12. Divided by two is six total pairs. I'm going to bond two oxygens together. I draw one bond, so that gives me five pairs. Oh, sorry, my dogs are barking.
All right, sorry about that. So my neighbor came home and my dog got upset about it. So um, I've used up one, two, three, four, five pairs. So I erase, sorry about that. I erase and I share to give both oxygens four total pairs. So one, two, three, four, five, six pairs total in my picture. And then both oxygens have, um, both oxygens have four total pairs to them. So two atoms are always going to have a linear molecular geometry. Okay. So let's look now at polarity. These notes are also in your, uh, on your worksheet. So notes for polarity. A polar molecule means that there is a separation of charge or one side is obviously positive and one side is obviously negative. So you can tell if your Lewis structure is polar if there are different types of atoms around the center atom or there are lone pairs on the center atom. So if you look at our first example here, NH3, NH3 is going to be polar because we have lone pairs here on our center atom. Okay, SO2 is also going to be polar because we have lone pairs on the center atom. SO3 is going to be nonpolar because we do not have lone pairs on the center atom. And then BeCl2 is nonpolar. Now, if these atoms or if these molecules were to have atoms that are different, so instead of having SO3, let's say we had S and O and a chlorine, okay? Because the chlorine and the oxygen would be different, that would make it polar. So on that example or that note down here about having um, if there are different types of atoms around the center. That would be like if we had carbon with three hydrogens and a chlorine attached. We have different atoms attached to that center atom and so that makes it a polar molecule. Okay. Now the last note down here about polarity says if your molecule only has two atoms, it is polar if there are two different atoms, and it's nonpolar if the atoms are identical. So on our example, I think I went too far. On our example here with O2, this is going to be nonpolar because I have... Um, two identical atoms. But if I were to have um, hydrogen bonded to fluorine, I would have a polar molecule because hydrogen and fluorine are not the same. Okay, so I hope this was a good quick little review for um, unit four. If we look at your worksheet, here. This is the worksheet that was emailed home to you. Um, you have some examples over here to draw Lewis structures. So I already put the notes on the, on the top of that page and then some space for you guys to do examples as well as being able to go back and find your molecular geometry. So on these for your examples, go ahead and draw the structure. and then tell the molecular geometry and the polarity. Okay, draw your structure, tell the molecular geometry and the polarity. So if you have any questions, please feel free to email me and let me know. Other than that, I hope you guys are having a good week and you're not feeling too stressed out with distance learning. So please reach out if you need some help, okay?